life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Welcome to Season 2, Episode 12 of The Walking Dead better angels we are in the home stretch of this second season both this episode and the episode after is very chaotic there's a lot happening so bear with us as we go through these episodes it's going to be a little crazy yeah yes a few things about this episode first is that it aired on amc in the united states and canada on march 11th 2012 it was directed by guy ferland and written by evan riley and showrunner Glenn Mazzara. And that is all I have. Usually I have more notes about... Yeah, like all the statistics and stuff right. like that. I don't have any for that episode. I think I have more in the ne- next episode. Also bear with us. It's been a couple weeks since we have watched this because I have had the flu. Mm-hmm. And I'm now over it. So we are doing this now. And although it won't matter to you guys because we're back recording these. So Yeah, we're it... recording a lot of them ahead of time. Right. So... Now, this is immediately after Dale has died in the previous episode. He got his giblets nibbled by a zombie that was unleashed by Carl accidentally. Mm -hmm. We are starting at the farm. Andrea, Shane, T-Dog, and Daryl are in the truck. And then they're also kind of switching with Rick doing a voiceover, talking about Dale as they're watching them in the truck. And then they're also at Dale's funeral. He is buried with Sophia and the rest of the members of Herschel's family on the farm in that one area under the trees. And this kind of shows like all of the remains of the old world mentality and of innocence. They're all buried in the same place together. And from this point on, Carl is having to adapt to Zombieland. The group that's in the truck is actually going to check the fences to make sure no more walkers get through because that one walker did come through a breach. So they are making sure the perimeter is secure. They are tracking where more zombies are coming from and they're killing them to make sure that none are coming onto the farm. Rick is saying that they need to fix the group and they need to work together from here on out. That's a really great thing in theory, but these people are traumatized. Yeah by things that have happened. They're traumatized by what happened in the barn. They're traumatized about what happened to Dale. And we're gonna talk a lot about the after effects of what Dale meant to this group and why there's such this devastation, even though it seemed like Dale was on the odds with people most of the time in his ability to see what the community was. Mm -hmm. The group is super upset. (laughs) So they're killing a walker and then they just all start kicking it. Like like a zombie punching bag, just like like they've just bullied something and then they're all in a circle, like gang style, like kicking it. But what I noticed is that this started with they killed it and then Shane comes up and he just starts kicking it and then he steps back and everybody comes in around it. And when he steps back, he has this soulless look on his face. Like he's he's leading them into this thing just to lead them to be angry. And it's not a good sign that the group is going along with it. Mm. It's like the fate of the finale is a steamroller named Shane. That's so true. Yeah. I mean, all of these things that are happening, especially what happens in this episode, is Shane. And then the next episode is kind of like the after effects Mm. of Shane. We break for the intro. This will be one of the last times we see this intro because I believe the intro changes in season three. Yes. Back at the farmyard, Herschel and the group are talking about everyone moving into the house. Uh, Rick says it'll be tight, but Herschel says it's okay, they'll figure it out. And Herschel says they should have done it a while ago. Uh, yeah? We, we agree there. Duh, Herschel. <laughs> Rick says to have lookouts on at the windmill and the barn to see out. So now they're going to have somebody on top of the windmill to see way out into the edge of the farm. And at this point, they're also talking about moving the cars to be around the entrances of the house. And this way, 
in the event that the bad guy marauder group that we've been hearing about comes to visit them, they can immediately just get their stuff together and run. Mm -hmm. Please keep in mind, Randall is still in the shack or the barn, one of those. The the tool shed. Yeah, Yeah. he's still there. So they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do to him. Like, how are they, what are they going to do? Yeah, that discussion is still going on. I feel like this discussion has been going on for like three episodes now. Yeah. So they're also going to fortify the basement in case either people or zombies attack them. They'll have a place to go down and fortify themselves in the basement of the house. Shane and Rick are going to take Randall out and cut him loose. And they they suggest that they're going to spare him in memory of Dale, this is what Dale would have wanted. And I think this is kind of a mistake that you're just going to make a decision entirely based off of, well, this guy died. We're going to do what he wants. Right. Especially when there is actually, if they're going to cut him loose, there's a better solution, Mm -hmm. really. But we already talked about that in a previous episode. So Shane says he doesn't want to go and that Daryl should go Instead, And then he and Lori shared this look. And I'm not exactly sure why they shared this look. It kind of was strange to me and out of place. But if y'all know, have a theory about this look. I don't. I really don't. Yeah. (laughs) Comment in. Share at Mm elatedgeek.com. Then Rick asks Andrea to help Herschel keep an eye on things when he isn't here. Rick says that uh, Shane is turning over a new leaf. And... Even Rick doesn't look convinced when he says this. Mm -hmm. He's like, "Eh, believe it, maybe. But she's kind of like acting annoyed at this. And I felt like this was really off because I felt she should feel like a little honored about the fact that he's asking her and not T-Dog and not Glenn, um, these other people. He's asking her like he sees that she is a leader who who could potentially move a situation if it need to be moved. He sees her now as a hitter. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. She kind of tells him off a bit by implying she sides with Shane and that Rick shouldn't leave the farm anymore. So she, is she basically saying that she can't handle it? Is she saying someone else should? Or is she just being nitpicky and being like, well, you shouldn't leave the farm? I think what she's really saying is that if he's so worried about Shane causing problems, then he just needs to deal with Shane rather than dancing around the problem and just letting it lie and hoping that it doesn't come to a bad end. This reminded me a lot of uh, Picard on Star Trek TNG where he's always getting into it with Riker about whether he wants to go, he wants to go on away missions and Riker's like, that's kind of my job, your job is to stay on the ship quit trying to micromanage and Rick is at that point where he basically is at that point where he doesn't really know what to do with all of the intense people. I agree with you. That that is kind of where this was. Shane is like, I mean, Rick is lamely trying to keep the peace, but he doesn't really know how to do it Mm -hmm. because he couldn't even keep the peace in his own household. Yeah. Pre thing. So he's like, he doesn't know what to do. So Carl wants to tell Shane about the gun he took from Daryl's motorcycle. All right. Here's the point where I have finally reached where we're going to have to have a discussion about this. We kind of talked about this in the last episode, but Carl dropped that gun next to the zombie and we never saw him go back. Never saw him get it. We've never seen him. It was just there. How does he have it again? I call foul and I call foul for two reasons. Number one, there is a whole like theory about how this this mysterious gun, like, you know, bad, bad hole in the plot. But also if he had gone, he would have seen that the walker is no longer in the creek. I think the zombie picked it up. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So my theory, and there is no evidence to it, but it's the only solution that I have, is that while everybody was going around securing the perimeter and kicking the crap out of zombies, he ran on back and got the gun. (laughs) I I think he did it after Dale died. Oh, I gotcha. Like he's trying to cover up the evidence, but then ultimately he gets too guilted out that he needs to talk to people. Right. And, And his guilt is a big part of this episode. Because, yeah, he doesn't go to his dad and tell him he goes to Shane. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he does feel guilty for what he did to the zombie. You know, he was playing with it, teasing it. And because of that, the zombie knew there was food somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when he went out, he went another direction. Shane tries to give the gun back to Carl. And I'm like, dude, that is not your gun to give. That is Daryl's gun, not yours. (laughs) Calm it down, Shane. 
Yeah, I thought uh, Shane was kind of teaching Carl not to be his own worst enemy at this point. A little bit. I think he's trying to have Carl take responsibility for what he did. And also learn how to kind of, for lack of a better term, man up and and be what he needs to be. Yeah. And at the same time, so that he's not running around, because obviously you're not going to control this kid anymore. Not, not effectively. He can and will go where he wants to. Might as well give him a gun. Right. I mean, Shane hasn't learned all the lessons he's trying to teach Carl yeah. completely, but right. he's also not a powder cake constantly. He does. There are moments where he's being strategic, so I don't know. It seems to be that's what he's kind of trying to teach Carl. The problem with Carl, though, is that after this, he says he's never touching another gun again, and I feel like he goes from one extreme to the other. Like, I have a gun, let's play, and then I'm not touching one again. No, no. Stick in the middle. Shane was teaching you gun safety. You need to go with that. Or stick to knives and slingshots, little buddy. Yeah. You know? Well, he was caught between his two parents that weren't getting along together. Now you add the third leg of this dysfunction being right. Shane, so he doesn't know what's going on. And it, and it, Shane is an instigator. We, we know. He's the yeah. instigator. So then Shane is taking some wood up to the windmill, which it looks like what he's going to do is build like a platform for somebody to stand on to keep watch. Daryl is fortifying the shack that Randall is in and Randall keeps trying to escape. Ugh. And his wrists are now bleeding because he's been trying for so long and the, the handcuffs are cutting into his wrist. Who else had to cover their eyes on this scene? I, I turned away momentarily. Oh. Back at the farmhouse, everyone is bringing their stuff in the house. We're moving in, everybody. Herschel's hospitality, 12 episodes in. Finally. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still not over the oxymoronicness of having faith and hope and love and Christian charity and not seeing these people for who they really are and not allowing trusting, yeah. yourself to help them. Yeah. But thank you, Herschel, for finally getting to this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? He had to let go of the dead in order to embrace the living. Correct. So Maggie says that Glenn can go to her room, but Glenn shows respect for Herschel by sacking it out in the living room. Right now. I'll get to that <laughs> later. <laughs> Lori is unpacking the truck. And T-Dog takes this bin from her, going like, don't strain yourself. And for, the, for many times we're seeing this as like, oh, it's another man coming to try and make it so the women aren't doing work or uh, stuff like that, making them feel weak. But in this case, when you see her trying to lift this tub, it is legitimately more than she can easily carry. Yeah, so I have this issue with myself many times, and I know that the two of you can confirm that this happens. But I will be like, I can do this. I'm going to carry this box. And they look at me like, no, <laughs> because they can see not only am I struggling, but that later on, my back is going to hurt. I am going to be in pain. They know. I think in this case, I totally agree with you. It's not a case of the men taking over for the woman. It's a case of T-Dog seeing something and caring about how Lori is. It is a family trait, by the way. I have people stop me at work all the time from lifting boxes about the size of your desk filled with frames, they'll be like, you need to stop that. Yeah. <laughs> Herschel says that Lori, Carl, and Shane can be in his room. He says it's our home, not mm. his home. He also says that the couch is where he's going to be sleeping and he gets to sleep with Glenn. Yeah. Yay. Great way to get to know your father-in-law. Future father-in-law slash sarcasm. Also, the, the reason why he's going for the couch, he says like, yeah, back when I used to drink a lot, me and that couch became good friends. Right, so the wifey <laughs> banished him to the couch. There is a deleted scene. So Glenn comes to Maggie and asks if her offer to bunk with her in her room still stands, probably because the living room is so crowded. She doesn't even say a word. She just grabs his guitar and starts walking up the stairs. Mm -hmm. That's the entire scene. And I was laughing because I think what happened is Herschel decides he's gonna bunk out in the living room. And then all these other people are there too because there's not a lot of room. And he's like, I don't know where to be. And so that's why he decided to go be with her. It's cute. Yeah. I, I know why they cut it, but I kind of like to think instead of that Glenn is respectful of Herschel, because let's be honest, they never have a chance to sleep in that house. Yeah. We'll get there. 
Lori sees Shane hammering those boards at the windmill and goes to talk to him. Uh, this scene. Uh, we're going to have to have a discussion about this scene. Because I really feel like this scene is the thing that makes Shane react the way he reacts for the rest of this episode. <sighs> So reality is really setting in for them and the hits just keep coming. You know, this person is dying. This person is infiltrating their camp. Someone's pregnant, etc. you know? She takes the blame for what happened between Rick and Shane, which is all well and good, except that she's sitting here poking the bear. Yeah. Okay, because she says she doesn't know whose baby it is, mm -hmm. right? So I think this kind of, although I don't think she intended for this to happen, it gives Shane hope that he and Lori could actually have a future because she doesn't know whose baby it is. She's sitting there going like, well, thank you for doing this and thank you for doing this. I don't think anybody's really thanked you for taking good care of us. And she's trying to pacify him by being grateful for all the good that he's done. And, and she hopes she can use this to like bring down his walls so he's not gonna go off on a rampage. But the problem is he's already delusional mm -hmm. about his relationship with her. So it only feeds his delusions. Right. And, yeah. In this case, we like to talk, I mean, we usually have to talk about what trouble Shane is. Lori is just as equally much tr trouble in these episodes. He is, however, visibly touched, and there are some tears brimming there. So now we're out on the front porch, and Rick and Daryl are planning to take Randall to Sonoya. We know a lot about Sonoya. There are a lot of things located in Sonoya that take place in this universe. It's also the town where scenes in Woodbury are filmed in season three. So when okay. we get to season three, we're gonna be more in Sonoya, but you know, when we were tracking the different freeways and the church, those are all in Sonoya. Rick asks Daryl if he's okay with the plan to drop off Randall in Sonoya. And Daryl responds, I don't see you and I trade in haymakers on the side of the road, if that's what you mean, nobody'd win that fight. Now, this is really interesting because in a later season, Rick and Daryl do in fact fight on the side of the road when Daryl is trying to distract Rick so that Maggie can kill Negan. And as Daryl predicts, it's a pretty even match and they fight to a draw. Talk about that later. That's pretty yeah. fun, right? Pretty fun. Shane drives up as Daryl is going into the house. He tells Rick about Carl and the walker and what happened with the taunting session. So Rick totally knows it's the same walker that got Dale. He is smart. Yeah, and he doesn't even let Shane finish the sentence. He's like, I know, I know it is. He says Lori will talk to Carl, but Shane says it should come from Rick. I totally agree. I, I guess I don't understand Rick's. Like maybe he's thinking it, Lori should do it because it would be more comforting to come from the mother, but it could also just be him not wanting to be confrontational. Oh, well, yeah, I get that. But he needs to start learning how to be confrontational because yeah. I think Carl needs more guidelines than they're giving him. And I think Lori isn't the type of mother to really give him guidelines. She's the type of mother to get upset about something and then go tell Rick to go give him guidelines. Yeah. Rick says he needs Shane at the farm and Shane knows it's because of his attitude. He says that Daryl can take the gun. So I think he gave Rick the yeah. gun that Carl gave him. Yes. And he says to give it to Daryl. He's also saying that it feels like freeing the prisoner is more important than what is happening with Carl. S seriously, you can't take 10 minutes for that? Yeah, it's much more important to just go be like, hey, so this is what happened. Let's talk about it. And then I got to go. Rather than go, potentially never come back and then talk to the kid. Exactly. During which time he can go get up to more trouble. At the RV camp is this really cute moment between Glenn and Andrea, where they're trying to move the RV closer to the house with the other vehicles, but they can't get it started. They will talk about how you have to tap it three times and give it a twist, which I thought was really cute. Glenn looks at the engine like Dale taught him how to. And he actually repeats straight up a line from season two, episode three, about how the points get corroded. And he remembers it's a flat head to take off the connectors. Like it's directly line for line from earlier on uh -huh. 
to show just how much these characters are connected. And it's a really special moment how Dale's influence on them both and how it had touched him and how Dale is kind of still there with him, Mm -hmm. with them. Uh, The RV, it, it still has a ways to go, I think, and in this little journey that they're taking, and it starts. At the barn, Rick goes to talk to Carl, who is in the barn loft, and he's kind of looking out on things. And then Rick gives Carl Daryl's gun. But it's still Daryl's gun, and Rick knows it's Daryl's gun, but he still gave it to him anyway. I'm still miffed about this. Like, seriously, Did what are you doing giving, guns? giving away this thing that belongs to Daryl? They have other guns. I don't get it. But it's kind of like Carl's second promotion in a way. First was the hat, and now he gets a gun. Yeah, so yeah. before he became the uh, an emotional point of connection, and now he's one of the action members. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Give him one of Dale's guns. Like, come on. Yeah. He talks about the circle of life and how we all die. That's just what happens. Also, I notice this is a position they're in a lot. They're on top of something high, looking down, having a father-son talk. I very much remember in a later season, they're on top of a house having a talk. So I think we're going to see this happen a lot more often. But this is also kind of like a Simba Mufasa moment. Again, they're talking about the circle of life, and it's almost like, ooh, look, we rule all of where the light touches, kind of moment, almost. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Rick shows his humanity and that he says he makes mistakes. And this, to me, is better than having a parent who tries to be perfect or have all the answers. So sometimes it's smarter to say, I don't know, I did wrong, but let's figure this out. And I feel, yeah, this this is what you can do for children, because... Passing down how you solve a problem is more important than passing down answers, since there's no way you are going to have all the answers for the future. I feel like this is just good sense for everybody. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter if you're a parent or a friend. Being able to say you're sorry and and figure out the problem together, I think, is a lot more honorable. At the shack, Randall's still cuffed. Mm -hmm. And we see some boots. I recognize those boots. It's Shane's boots. He gets in a chair to scare Randall. And instead of doing the uh, cocky squatty position, because obviously Randall can't see him because he's blindfolded, he gets in the chair. Shane really wants to take care of Randall. Like, really wants to take care of Randall. Like, not take yeah. care of Randall, but he wants to take care of Randall. And you can kind of see the monster starting to brew a little bit more. And you can see, like, he's actively fighting his desire to kill Randall. It's almost like a golem schmeagle situation as the two of them are dueling with each other inside his facial expressions and as the desire grows he starts growling like a walker Mm -hmm. he does that a lot in this episode i think we're gonna we're gonna touch on that a little later he does see the wounds on randall's wrists from trying to escape as well and i think it kind of gives him a thought Mm -hmm. in the farmyard rick and daryl are ready to go T-Dog brings Daryl Dale's gun because he doesn't know where his is. I told you that is Daryl's gun. T-Dog says he will get the package, meaning Randall. T-Dog bangs on the door and says, the governor called, you're off the hook. Now I was laughing. Does this reference the governor from Woodsbury? But not really. Yeah. I don't think because so. you know it, it's like the it's like just the death row, it's mm-hmm. the death row scene right well i know that but it's very much i think it's foreshadowing it's kind of, to, yeah. of the governor of woodsbury also the code on the lock is 0003 but it's upside down so it's really 3000 i don't know if that has any but randall is not there dun 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 yeah yeah in the forest you see where randall is with shane who has taken him away, blindfolded and bound. He wants Randall to take him to his camp. And we're kind of left to think, well, maybe Shane is looking to join the bad guys. But no, Hmm. no. Although Randall keeps going like, oh, you're gonna love him, man. You'll fit right in, everything's great. But we find out it's just a deterrent, what's happening. Shane keeps looking behind him to see if they're being followed. He's being really sketchy. And then, I'm sorry, we're just going to make this really short and sweet. He takes Randall behind the tree, and it sounds like he broke his neck, um, which I think later on we do confirm he did break his neck. Yeah, and you can totally hear it. We don't see Shane walking away with a knife, so he didn't stab him. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back out so you can see him again. He tries to make it look like he was beat up. 
He's hitting a tree. With his face. It looks like it's a, at his face, yeah. And he's acting like he's trying to show that it was a fight that they got in. And again, Shane makes the walker sounds as he kind of gears himself up to run into the tree. I also think it's kind of really funny that Randall must have been in such a desperate state to think that he was going to walk him to his camp. Yeah. They, I mean, at that point, if he had any clue, he would have just started running as fast as he could away from Shane. Because why wouldn't he get in a car and take him to his camp? Right. Which yeah. walk him into the woods? Yeah. That, not smart, Randall. Mm-mm. At the farm, Shane is kind of hiding in the trees at the edge, watching the group find out that Randall is gone. And they start investigating, like... Where did he go? And there's all kind of like this chaotic yelling moment. Like, I saw him here. Did you see him here? No, the lock was gone. Okay, well, do did you see? Where's this person? I don't know. Right? Who's so on first? He ends up hiding the gun in the leaves at the edge of the trees. And then he kind of comes out and puts on this whole show of saying that Randall had his gun and escaped. And everyone is like totally upset. Like, <laughs> they're like, oh, no, he's out there with a the gun. What do we do? Rick, Glenn, Daryl, and Shane, quote, unquote, Shane, go to find Randall. I put, quote, unquote, Shane because he's not going to find Randall. He knows where Randall is. Yes. Daryl doesn't really buy this whole routine that Shane is coming up with. Daryl doesn't really buy a lot of Shane's routines. And he's like, did the kid really get a jump on Shane? Like, he, there are several things that make him suspect otherwise. Daryl uh-huh. grew up with toxic masculinity, so let's face it, he smells it quick. Yeah, and that's why, like, Daryl has always seen through Shane's lies, but up until this point, he's been kind of quiet about it. After Dale's death, though, and after Dale tapped him and passed on the truth teller, he's going to call him on it. And now it's Daryl's turn to cut straight to the truth with everything that he says. Mm-hmm. So the group splits up to find him. We have Rick and Shane in one group and Glenn and Daryl in the other group. Then we go back to the farmhouse where we see everyone else is like downstairs. They're getting the windows shuttered. They're trying to fortify the doors, etc. They're making the beds because they know they're probably going to have to hunker down for the night because Randall is gone. So they, they assume he's going to bring his camp back. Carl is at the upstairs window and he's looking out across the farm with Shane's binoculars. We know these are his binoculars from before. In the forest, Rick comments on Shane's busted nose. He's like, wow, that's kind of a bad nose thing you got. And Shane's like, no, it's fine. They're scouting in the dark and can't see much. And at this point, I'm going to tell you, neither can I. Because when I was trying to watch this part of the episode, it was so dark, I could barely see what was happening. Mm -hmm. Rick keeps looking at Shane kind of suspiciously because I think he's finally seeing through the crap. Mm-hmm. Shane knows where all of this went down, but he's still trying to pretend like, oh, yeah, maybe he's over here. Let's maybe see over here. And Daryl's comments has put enough doubt in Rick's head that he doesn't believe what Shane is saying. And then he kind of sees, OK, well, this guy hasn't turned over a new leaf. He's probably leading me in circles. Right. So when we go back to Daryl and Glenn, we see Daryl the tracker. And I mean, we all know Daryl's smart, mm-hmm. right? He can see the tracks and he is working out in his head that it probably didn't go down exactly how Shane was saying. The tracks are together, not one person following the other. Like Shane said, he sees blood and where the fight might have happened. Then they find Randall's blindfold and they see a zombie and they realize it's Randall. Mm -hmm. But I have an issue with this. Isn't his neck broken it is i i after doing some research on the inner but inner webs inner i am not the only one questioning this a zombie who dies from a broken neck would be unable to walk or even move a broken neck with a severed spinal cord and the spinal cord must be severed for this sort of injury to be lethal is effectively the same as if the head is completely severed so technically randall should not be a zombie. Yeah, he, he should just be sitting there with his head going, ang, 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 ang. like mm-hmm. we see all the time with all a decapitated the time. zombie. Yeah. I was going to say it earlier, but if Glenn Mazar is the showrunner at this point, that means that Darabont has already left. Mm-hmm. Correct. If an upheaval like that of somebody leaving the show mm-hmm. that had the vision, that is a uh, you know an Oscar-nominated person, him leaving the show could have th- thrown off the production to this point where things are right okay price. yeah they just didn't somebody didn't question this plot point but i do think the way that the plotting happened the way they were doing the reveals and the tension of the two groups in the forest was really great 
Um, mm-hmm. I, re- I really yeah. like the way they handled it. That whole tracking sequence was great up until they come across Zombie Randall. Right. Nevertheless, Glenn finishes off Randall, and he is now dead dead. Rick starts to question Shane's story. So there's a whole scene about that. I don't really care to go into it. Then we're back to Daryl and Glenn, and Daryl confirms that his neck was broken and he has no bites. So the two of them kind of look at each other and they realize who actually killed Randall. And when you get to all of this, if they skip the scene where they got attacked by dead Randall and just skip to them examining the body here, everything would have made absolute perfect sense and would have retained all the tension that we wanted. I think that you could probably just cut that scene out posthumously and right. keep going. But they had to get a little bit of a thrill. Which... It's not just that, but they have to set up the fact that Rick knows that what what the truth about it is that everybody's a zombie until they die. That's what they're that's the reveal that they're trying to do. Not arguing with the broken neck theory right. that you're saying, but that's mm-hmm. what they're trying to convey here. It's like, oh crap, there's something more to this than we thought. Before. Right. So here is where we come to an iconic Walking Dead scene. This is where it kind of all goes down. And I, before we even start on this, I need to say that as much as I don't necessarily like Shane in this series, because I'm frustrated, you need a villain, and he's kind of villain-esque, the acting in this scene is superb. Yes. We're going to talk about that a little later, but oh my gosh, I know what happens in this scene and every time I'm still blown away by what is going on. So Shane and Rick are walking back to the farm as Rick continues to question Shane. And he's walking ahead of Shane because he's already suspecting him very heavily. But if you question the guy from behind him, then it's obvious that you don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So he's putting himself in a risky position in order to keep him talking. Yeah, so the first thing he said was, well, you know, what about the door to the shed? Oh, he says that the shed was locked when T-Dog got there. We know that. T-Dog said that. We saw the lock. But Shane says that it was open. There is a beautiful shot of the two of them with this large moon in the field. Again, the cinematography was great in this one as well. And then all of a sudden Rick says, so this is where you plan to do it. So he knows and he's figured out because he knows Shane so well that this is where Shane plans to kill him. He asked Shane's story, what is it going to be when you return alone? And this is a story that only works if you don't have Daryl as a tracker. Yeah, Shane's blind spot was Daryl's tracking. He, mm-hmm. he, I mean, the moment somebody said Daryl should go out there, he should have, like, tried to weasel his way out of that because... There's no, there's no discounting Daryl's. Yeah, he skill. should have been like, yeah, Daryl, I think I need to have you staying back and protecting everybody because you're the best. Right. But, yeah, he's kind of discounting Daryl as if Daryl is just this hillbilly, but he's not yeah. a hillbilly. Mm. He underestimates Daryl a lot, and I think a lot of people underestimate Daryl. Because he's quiet. I also don't think they, mm-hmm. you know, he doesn't speak that much. So they don't regard him. Shane starts to goad Rick into killing him. He says he is a better father than Rick is. He's better for Lori. He's a better man. He says that Lori is a broken woman and Carl is a weak boy. Things to get Rick's temperature up. And I would not characterize those two characters in that way. Mm -mm. Lori is scared and trying to cling to safety, but I would not actually call her a broken woman Mm -mm. at this point. No. And Carl is growing into his strength. It's just Mm -hmm. that he doesn't have a lot of good guideposts. Yep. Rick says he's going to have to kill an unarmed man and tries to reason with him because he doesn't really want to, but I think it's starting to dawn on him that he's going to have to. So then Rick pulls a knife and basically gets Shane in the stomach, but there's also a gunshot. Shane fires his gun. That's that's the the gunshot gunshot you're hearing. Okay. So Rick is also upset that he had to do this because Shane basically made him do this. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see these like jump shots where the monster in Shane starts to come alive even more. The true zombie monster that is in Shane is really becoming more prominent. 
and I'm kind of wondering, like, you see all of these zine- scenes from zombies up close, like they're eating, they're attacking, and that's what's going on in his head as he's reanimating. Is this what plays in the minds of walkers? Who knows? When you're when you're a zombie, is all you're seeing... The collective unconscious of zombies. Yeah. At this point, as Rick is staying with Shane, he is devastated in what he had to do. I mean, the way that he is crying is heartbreaking. And then Carl comes out and sees what's happened. Remember, he was up in the window with the binoculars so he could see exactly what was happening. So he sees that Shane is dead, but what you don't see is that he says basically to Rick like what happened or something like that and raises his gun up so it looks like he's about to shoot Rick so what you don't see is that Shane is reanimating up and that Carl is basically going to shoot Shane and what a shot yeah (laughs) what a shot but what I do note is that this doesn't seem like it's been hours Shane reanimates very quickly and when he does so this grin plays on his face. Remember in um, season one, episode seven, they talk about how they have seen them reanimate anywhere from three minutes to eight hours. Yes, and that's actually part of my point here. Because when he reanimates, he comes after Rick and now he's got this like evil grin. I think it's possible, like we were saying before, that those that reanimate rather quickly after dying might be smart zombies. Mm. And they start displaying more personality. He's showing personality after not being dead that long. So right. he may be another Mr. Brick from mm-hmm. season one. Gotcha. I would also say the adrenaline in the system, like he was firing at all cylinders right before he got killed. So mm. it would make sense. So Carl finishes the zombie Shane off and he has a really good shot. And Rick looks at Carl like, dang, son. Mm-hmm. Um, there are two sh- gunshots, one from Shane, one from Carl. Mm-hmm. And it brings all the walkers to the yard. Carl's gunshots were better than yours. He'd teach you, but he'd have to charge. I would say the one thing that struck me about this is Rick's frustration with having to kill Shane is kind of like Dale's frustration toward the end when he's like, okay, you guys have all given up. It's all over. It's that similar oh, type yeah. of thing. It's like, I can't have you as a friend is equal to this society, uh, civilization has gone off the rails to the point where I can't, you know, it's that level of, like, frustration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In his interview with Entertainment Weekly, Bernathal recalled the production of the scene. We shot that scene all night long, and the entire cast came out and spent the entire night on that field to be there for the last scene. And Jeff DeMunn, who is Dale, actually had been gone. He lives on a farm in upstate New York, and he had flown down and surprised me to be there for my last scene. Aww, that's so that's awesome. really kind of cool that they had behind this kind of family off camera as well, that they all came out and supported them. And here's my note, my personal note. Does Carl's decision to not shoot the walker domino into, and I'm talking about the walker at the creek, mm-hmm. domino into one, Dale's death, two, killing zombie Shane because he feels guilty about Dale, three, causing the downfall of the farm because the noise of the gunshots beckons the walkers there. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that has happened here, you can point directly at that action, which was indirectly spawned by improper parenting. And the need of the season to end. Well, yeah. (laughs) It did. Let's talk about the kill shot and who kills the living. Um, yeah. So first we have Shane killing Randall. Out of greed, because he now wants to control everything. It's a coup. And then we have Rick killing Shane. To protect the group, because Shane Cray. Mm -hmm. So we had been talking about, like, differentiating between killing the living for protection versus other reasons. And I think the earlier Shane, he kills Otis. And was, was, is that, did we say that was a protection or no? No, he did it to save himself. Correct. So the two that Shane has done were both selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ones that Rick has done, even though Rick has a bigger body count than Shane, Rick now has three to Shane's two, but he was doing it mostly to protect Mm -hmm. the group. 
I think it's also, Andrea didn't really use her gun in this episode, so we have nothing to say about that. I didn't see any clocks. But let's talk about the title, Better Angels. So in this episode, everyone talks about how Dale was the best of them in his moral thoughts, how he taught them, and how he cared for people. Mm -hmm. We also see in this episode, in different scenes, Rick and Lori are both trying to appeal to Shane's better angels in this attempt to calm him down. Mm -hmm. But... In the end, Rick, Daryl, and Glenn emerge from this conflict as leaders of the group. So in the end, the better angels win. Correct. In the comics, the only real note I have about this is that Carl actually kills Shane, does not kill zombie Shane, and he does it before they even arrive at Herschel's farm. That is a very small difference, but it still is a direct reference. Even like in the way that it's illustrated in the graphic novel is very similar to how it is shown in the show. And that is it for season two, episode 12, Better Angels. Next week, we talk about season two, episode 13, the last of season two, Beside the Dying Fire. Don't let the fire go out. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. <laughs>